Welcome everyone to this annual David Goodborn lecture. It's a pleasure to have you, those of you who are in the room and those of you who are online with us. Welcome to Luther King Centre and the Centre for Theology and Justice. I'm Graham Adams. I'm a member of staff here at Luther King Centre, uh, tutor in World Christianity, Mission Studies and Religious Diversity. So it's my pleasure to welcome Mario Aguila, who's Professor of Religion and Politics at the School of Divinity of the University of St Andrews. He was born in Chile and came to the UK 40 years ago and has been involved in the search for the disappeared, interfaith dialogue and the possibility of inclusion for the poor and the marginalised within society and the churches. His latest books include After Pestilence and Interreligious Theology of the Poor, The 14th Dalai Lama, Peacekeeping and Universal Responsibility, Pope Francis, Journeys of a Peacekeeper and Nadia Murad, Yazidi and world peacemaker. So it's our pleasure to invite you to come and speak to us, Mario. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for inviting me to deliver this lecture. It is not a secret that this is after pestilence too. So if you have read one, you're very welcome to give me some hints on After Pestilence too. We honor the memory of David who died in November 2014, a Baptist and former General Secretary of Churches together in Britain and Ireland. He was president of the Ecumenical Partnership for Theological Education, Luther King House, and previously served in the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches. So in his memory, then, we strive to search for a common path for history together, for memory, and at the same time to do this with and taught by the poor and the marginalized. And I wanted to ask you to focus on this photograph we have here, because this is the theologian I have invited today to share with us where we are going. And some of the stuff I'm going to talk about is probably very strong, but simply I was asked to set boundaries. And I'm not very good at setting boundaries in that I don't believe in boundaries. So I'm going to speak for 45 minutes and then allow for discussion and so on. So I'm going to give you the summary first of this. God does not have boundaries. And therefore, this is not a truism. This is not a philosophical paradigm. But simply, in whatever happens in the church, we are looking for love, justice, and divine inclusion. But what I'm saying at the end of the lecture is that we cannot have love, justice, and divine inclusion without the poor. And yes, I can see the questions in each one of my lectures. Somebody will raise their hand and say, what about the rich? That we leave to Rush, who is working with people who are not considered poor and the marginalized. But we have this problem. It is a problem in our theology, in our pastoral care, and in our lives. That very quickly we get completely settled and we forget what happened at the beginning. So let me bring you to the beginning first and then I'll do the end. My reflections arise out of a particular text for those of you who come from more scriptural traditions than me. Matthew 25, Matthew 25, the parables of the kingdom cannot be ignored. And the parables of the kingdom are really quite clear. What we do rather than say, rather than what we reflect and what we're about to do in relation then to those who need us. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was an infirm person and you came and helped me. I was on the side of the road and you came to me. I was 
a victim of clerical abuse or teacher's abuse, and you came to me rather than reading the next report or understanding the next figure. This is where we, I am going. So therefore, the, the Matean paradigm is a Copernican re revolution within Christianity and within all the world religions in that we return not to the cross and you will forgive me um, simply because I'm going to focus on the empty tomb. The empty tomb for me is the most precious moment of Holy Week. And the, when, when we see the empty tomb, we are seeing our fragility. This is not the redemptive act of the Christ. This is not the resurrection with the bunny rabbits and our happiness, but the empty tomb is the moment in which we feel completely lost. And therefore the empty tomb is the paradigm of Matthew 25. We don't know who we are going to meet on the street, in our families, or where we work, but we know what is asked of us. And let me be very clear, I never understood why it is so difficult to understand the Copernican revolution of Matthew 25. So, I'm using here the aspect of margins, but the margins are not our, our margins. The margins are where then God and other good people in society operate. Therefore, there is a movement in Matthew 25 in social justice, which yes, we need the document. Yes, we need to agree. Yes, we need to discuss it. But that is not the beginning or the end of Matthew 25. That is our own sense of being human, being fragile. And because we are human and we are fragile, we tend to do things in a very complicated way. The difference, for example, between common understanding and consensus. Do we need a consensus to understand God? Do we need a common understanding? In reality, we don't. God can exist in our lives and in the lives of the world without us moving God. And this is the part that particularly in our churches we have forgotten. Social justice is to assume that God is just and that we are not. And so therefore the, the reflection on ourselves will always conduce to an imperfect response. We assume that God liberates, not because he is a liberator in the words of Leonardo Boff and others, but because his sense was to liberate people. From the Exodus onwards, we have a God that by nature liberates. And therefore, I want to focus on this lady who is behind me, Michelle Clementi. And I chose her because she is revered. She died this year, sadly. And she is revered by those who are in the borders and boundaries of the church and of society in the port of Valparaiso in Chile. Why was she revered? She was revered because she provided a place where people could get food. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. But on top of that, people could be accepted in their dignity. So they could have a home. The difficulty for us, maybe, maybe not for some of you, is that she was a transsexual. And so those of you who know me or have read my writings will know that I go from one boundary to the other. I don't do theology of sexuality, homosexuality or others, but when I was preparing the lecture, it was very clear that God speaks to us 
in a moment in which something happened. And as I was writing the lecture, then Michelle died. And therefore, how do we react to the Matthean chapter 25 Copernican revolution when these things happen? So when I was invited, and I'm very grateful and very honored to have been invited to deliver the lecture, my thought was, yes, I can do social justice, more or less talking about the justice and the equality of the state. And I can simply suggest that everybody is entitled to equality, dignity, and so on. But it happens that the, the master that we professed is a master that wanted more from us than that. So we are not civil servants, we are not policy makers, we are actually people who read Matthew 25 and said, here I am Lord, and I'm here to do your will. And so therefore, what do we do with our dear Michel Clemente? Michel Clemente was born as a man, then discovered that he was a homosexual at age 13. His mother had died, so he was thrown from that home into a shanty town. And little by little needed to reinvent identity, etc. And therefore, I haven't had that existence. I was, I was a political prisoner at one point or another with bad militaries, but I haven't lacked anything since. And my reflection was then, how do we understand social justice outside our documents? And don't take me wrong, the documents are needed. The churches together need to have a document to move something forward. Yes, we need to do it. But the first concern that we have with those boundaries is not the definition of a boundary because we already have it. And this is our problem. God does not have boundaries. And so therefore, why do we put them? Notice that here the whole edifice of the church could crack up in the next five minutes. If you say there must be boundaries, God put them. I ask you where, how, when. So let's return to the first Christian community in the Acts of the Apostles. And this to some of those who are at the lecture could sound very preachy and very churchy, but we are doing a sociological study. It is very clear that by the third century, Christians were accepted not because of virtue, but because of belief. So that somebody will come to one of the communities who were meeting at houses and so on, and will say, I want to hear more. And I do believe that Christ is Lord. It was in medieval times that we began putting law before, uh, law before virtue and then virtue before belief. So therefore, social justice cannot be an exact copy of the British government manifesto for social inclusion. We need to go further. So if I see the categories of the law in the United Kingdom of inclusion, who is included, then I read myself as a theologian that we need to go further before than the British government we need to be more courageous and more daring. Now I lost some of you already, but the worst is still to come. So the action of, of, choose, of choosing in which way we are going to act cannot be mixed with a phenomenon of the 21st century, which is horrifying. And in my lecture, I have a whole section on that which is called entitlement. The children of God of the 21st century are entitled according to themselves, to education, to housing, to a good life, to happiness, 
to a bank holiday and so forth. And I wonder if entitlement is what, the individual entitlement is what makes us forget then social justice. We have become churches with, I am one of them, so don't look at me and say, who is he accusing? I am a professor in a prestigious university with a good salary. I can take the train and speak to you and I'm off to London tomorrow. So I'm not saying that I'm very different, but my reflection goes on that entitlement. The first Christians were not entitled to be clean, to be in the borders they did not like, or to have the benefits that we have in society today. They follow the master and what awaits them was simply martyrdom and death. And this is sometimes said about the global South churches and the global North. And maybe the global North needs a bit of shaking up because simply they have forgotten that a good collection on a Sunday or the new bells or the new bells and smells in other traditions will actually bring down the kingdom of God on people. So you ask me, and I'm just responding, that simply social justice is not about somebody else. It is about ourselves. It is about myself forgetting that I am entitled to salvation. You know, I'm a Roman Catholic. And so therefore we fought the reformation on all sides to understand what grace was. And it seems that in 21st century, we have forgotten our ABC. We are not entitled to grace. Grace comes as a gift from God. It doesn't matter how many prayers we do, whatever. Social justice comes into that. And let me give you another figure. In the early Christian community of Rome, in a place which is called today Roma Monti, and that's why I am going with some pilgrims on May to Roma Monti to declare again the sheer humanity. Roma Monti was a place outside the walls. So these were people who did not mean anything to the Roman Empire or to the city. And who was welcome there? Those who came and asked then to be part of the Christian community. And the historical archives are very clear. Who lived in Roma Monti? The prostitutes and the gay community of Rome. They were there. They have been hidden from history. And just in case if you wonder, I am heterosexual and happy to be. I'm not here with a personal agenda, but with the reflection that in reality, we have put the boundaries that maybe God does not want. So to give you the, the summary of how I read, for example, the gospel and social inclusion and dignity, the birth of the Messiah happened in a poor stable. He was a refugee fleeing persecution. He preached love and forgiveness to all and chastised the rich, the opulent, and the oppressive powers by entering Jerusalem on a donkey. He was tried as a political prisoner. He was abused and tortured. And finally, after a painful death, he was risen by the father. The New Testament does not use the expression, he rose from the dead. He was risen by the father in the Greek text. So therefore, what kind of God have we invented over the centuries? How, what kind of God in our own entitlement have we suggested that this should be? I think social justice then comes from a God that wants justice, but he wants justice for Michel as well as any other who is not in the boundaries of, or outside the boundaries of society. And therefore, let me have a little dialogue with N.T. Wright here, my good old friend. Our problem comes from Paul. 
believe it or not. I'm ready to be stoned. I can take the, the train to London tonight. I can take the sleeper rather than sleeping in this wonderful center. Our problem came with Paul, the apostle, because he was entitled to privileges because he was a Roman citizen. And therefore he was not the same as the others who were killed because simply he could claim Roman citizenship. Yes, I can see the shock. Don't worry. They will be released from this at the end of the lecture. But the Pauline corpus is what complicates our existence. Is that simply suddenly the Christians who were in the fringes of society they are now entitled. The discussion between Peter and Paul then on the possibilities of circumcision are very crucial because Peter is entitled to be an important leader of the community because he was a Jew and was circumcised. So he's not letting it go. And then Paul says, no, we leave circumcision, grace is for everybody, but I am a Roman citizen, remember. Have you ever thought of that passage there? Yes, our dear apostle Paul entitled now. So we need to be critical with our reading of the past, the present and the future, because God does not have that entitlement. In a sense, the, the only thing we can say about God is that he died on the cross. So there was not much entitlement to, to many great things. And so therefore, I want to ask a few questions here with the help of the greatest of today, the prophetic voices that I will say, if you ever want to read something or feel inclined to take another book yet, um, then I'm speaking here about the work of Camila Vergara, a, a historian of constitutionalism, a person who has written about Rome and Greece, which has been our preoccupation for a long time, and has written about the modes in which decisions were taken. The plebeian world, in her own words, uh, is the world in which People are not entitled, but people work together. An excellent work that is complemented then by Victoria Turner, a young activist who takes a group of young and asks them, what do you think we should be doing? And, and this volume comes, which is absolutely staggering of beauty, prophetism, and apocalyptic epistemological beauty. And, and those Jews point not to us, but they point to something that we're missing. David Toombs on the issue that the master was probably sexually abused before being crucified. This has enormous implications because if the master was sexually abused, then we need to do something about it. We need to apologize, we need to do reparation, we need to take this as something more important than just a sociological fact that some people are victims. Rocio Figueroa works in the same. These are, these are some of the classics that SCM has brought us in the case of Camila Vergara. It wasn't published by SCM, but I was saying to her several times, there is a very clear sense of what was happening in the great civilizations and the possibility of opinion, dignity, and entitlement by the poor to what we read then in the New Testament. Pablo Picasso. Let's go to beauty. A womanizer in the fourth volume of, of his biography just out. It is impossible to count anymore how many women he was keeping here and there. But he had one redeeming sense of himself. He did not paint for money. Otherwise he would have been a tremendously rich man. He painted the people that was moving with him. So if you wanted to know who 
Pablo Picasso was loving at that time, you will simply look at what he was painting. The lady has changed. But when, when this agent said, look, do 10 paintings, each one will be $1 million and you will be all right for the rest of your life. He said, I am not a painter because of what I paint. I am a painter because of who I am. And this is the question then with Picasso, do we want to be people of entitlement or not? Because people of social justice do not have any entitlement apart than a little bit of free grace and a cup of tea from time to time. Now notice that we need to look at classes such as James Joyce's Ulysses, one of my favorite books. It is an extraordinary book because it narrates how a woman committed adultery and it gives the date of that adultery. And this is a volume of hundreds of pages, which is a classical for in literature, but it has a very human content that simply somebody had committed adultery. So Nadia Murad, the Nobel Prize winner, the lady who has led the knowledge and reparation towards the Yazidi in their genocide from 2014, 2017. Um, we have Ramin Jahanbeglo, an Indian scholar who speaks about fragility. And we have Marcela Suarez, a victim of violence, who has managed to get hundreds of volunteers together in order to show to others that in a way the victims are at the forefront of who we are and our lack of entitlement. So this was called in the lecture, just the beginning, because this probably will be a book. But simply let me summarize what I have said so far. I have said that there is nowhere in our origins as a Christian community that we can claim that entitlement made us Christians. Neither we can say that in our theologies, nor we can say that in our theological education. So social justice must come out of our origins, not of somebody else's model. Secondly, the boundaries. The boundaries do not exist for God. And if we look, for example, at passages in the Old Testament, you will see very clearly there that God is, is even destroying the boundaries, for example, of Egypt by force. One of the very puzzling things in the, in the Christian scriptures and in the Hindu scriptures, of course, is that simply gods order or kill themselves. Yes, the Egyptians were killed. Has anybody thought of their families? Then the people of Israel advance in the desert towards the promised land and the poor Hittites, Jebusites, they all get killed. So, Nowhere I can find myself that social justice is about an imagination of something that doesn't include the possibility that God acts in history and in the world. And the third one then is simply the possibility that we encounter then God first. And then we understand what social justice is. It's not a definition. And here, don't blush, let me quote Eve Parker. It is here that we encounter the God who takes the side of the marginalized because she is herself marginalized. So God is not entitled, he's marginalized. So, the reflection of after pestilence too suggests that there is a possibility of change in social justice. 
and Juan Luis Segundo, a Uruguayan Jesuit, suggested in his lectures on the liberation of theology. And this is the best quote I could ever find. A human being who is content with the world will not have the least interest in unmasking the mechanisms that conceal the authentic reality. I repeat, a human being who is content with the world will not have the least interest in unmasking the mechanisms that concealed the authentic reality. So if I am entitled and I'm okay, I will not see reality around me. So therefore, to achieve social justice lies within a central paradigm, that of histories. Human beings live in space and time and God moves within the realms of human beings in the context of stories and particular histories. History becomes legend and myth, the beginning of the Lord of the Rings. And myth becomes history. The history of a God who walks in history, who acts in history and moves through history. Thus, social justice can only be achieved through material history in the materiality of a divine presence and a human realism within the symbolic actions that connect history as religion and the historical arrangements of a history that is made into social actions with the police, within the police, within the politics of humans and gods together. It is here that theologians and practitioners of religious paradigms need to avail themselves of the best possible experts on equality and inclusion, not only from the social and political sciences, but from the biological and hard sciences. I am strongly suggesting that we are not supposed to know about everything. We don't. And so therefore, it is very clear that in seeking social justice, the churches need to avail themselves of the experts on injustice. And therefore, in order to understand the causes of injustice, the causes of entitlement, and what actually is happening in society. One thing in Matthew 25 is to love a refugee. The other is to understand the causes of all that happened and took place and therefore why do we have the refugee? And the third one is the complete social injustice of a refugee who cannot work in this country, for example, because simply is not treated as a human being. I'm almost at the night train back to Scotland. So therefore, for example, these thinkers, Marcela Suarez, Camila Vergara, are people who have decided that out of the injustice that comes, could come a reparation and could come certainly justice. So therefore, in their case, there is a house of reparation being planned for the victims where they can prepare themselves a cup of tea. We're entitled to our cup of tea, but they're not. And so the periphery does exist and God lives and walks in those peripheries today. So therefore we must contest and anti right knows this the position of the Apostle Paul. I'm the first one who loved to write a book, simply analyzing Paul as a person who was cared by the communities. He wasn't a victim, he was a Roman citizen. He could move throughout the empire. We have missed those details. So where are the borders of theology and social justice? The borders do not exist. They are only set by what has already been, been called a structural sin. Social justice does not exist when a structural sin does exist. A structural sin refers very simply to a structure that impedes God to act in the world. And therefore, if there is a structure or a law or a public policy, or a law within the church that impedes God's action in the world, 
then those structures need to come down. So let me return here then to Camila Vergara and the plausibility of the, or the implausibility that the institutions that oppress through corruption could be sustained within the democratic institutions of a particular state. Remember that our churches are institutions. We love them, but they're institutions. They're charitable bodies, which in law are entitled to privileges. I won't speak about pensions and other things, which could be rather painful. But you see, we have our entitlement in that we don't realize I just read the letter a couple of days ago in that a former Jesuit said, well, I was never given a pension and I, I almost screamed. That person had freely given his life to God and nobody ever promised a pension or something else. Why is he complaining now? It's simply because we are in the 21st century. We are people of entitlements. So Camila Vergara, ideas come as proposals of change. When she argues that plebe plebeian institutions allowing for the direct participation of all other residents in the liberation and public judgment are foundational to free government. Equal liberty for all residents cannot be guaranteed without them. I'm including the churches there. I have said to her so many of the things she has thought about and written have a lot to say to our own churches. So let me, well, there are many more pages about this. I'm going to read you the conclusions. And, and of course, if you want a copy of this, you are, you are entitled, yes. You are entitled to have a copy of this, which you can burn or not, but simply, um, I think it is, it is the, the duty of somebody who gives a lecture simply to um, proceed to give the ideas to others. If I find my conclusions yet there. It is a truism to suggest that theology is a narrative about God made by humans and that God reveals herself within human history. Thus, the history of salvation does not end with the biblical text, but depends fundamentally on what Raymond Panikar has termed Christophany, the manifestation of the Christ in a particular moment. The experts on Christology here among us will understand this. So Christophany is understood as a divine and human manifestation within the world of humans, an ongoing constant and tangible revelation. In such material world, the Christian God and many other deities and divinities provide an immanent eternal game of power, powerlessness and powering that resemble the opportunistic freedom of the self. We are entitled and we're very opportunistic on our entitlements. Indeed, history, human and divine, reminds us of the selfish through material forms, religious norms, and historical representations of different kinds. History becomes a hermeneutical world of avatars in which humans make mistakes. They follow truisms and canons, and God is given the task to intervene, to make those changes part of what was intended as a parody of the res publica, so the public thing that was not intended. The public entitlement then becomes only entitled through the person of Christ and surrounded by a world that God created, not us. So what I'm doing in this first part of the conclusion is to give the possible maximum ontological sense of being to what we call then social justice. It is not a policy. It does exist in the immanence of God. In a very complicated world of logical paradigms, she who is a Christian is the one who can accept the kerygma. But the kerygma then reflects a certain understanding in history. And therefore, 
she who wants then to understand God must understand God as the only source of social justice. This is where social justice is elevated to being something that we cannot change rather than a discussion on how can we do a public policy about this. The difference between a church and the House of Commons, two different things. So our communal search for justice is carried out within a contradictory world of crimes against humanity, genocide and horrific abuses against women, children and sexual crimes within wars and the absolute command to love all. And this is where, if you follow my Twitter, you don't have to, I already announced all this in the train as I was coming. God loves all, capital letters, not some, not in particular circumstances, nor in our own limited understanding. God loves all. So truisms and materialism create a problem. In that truisms that do exist, but then we come with our materialistic entitlement. Sometimes God is on our way. God doesn't allow us to do what we think that God should do. And therefore, social justice needs to stop this. Simply, this is a messy world. This is not the world of, not everybody is ethical, not everybody recycles. I always remember that during the week when Sunday, I don't know in which bean to put something. And somebody says that goes into the green bean, not the blue one. And I said, okay, I'm too tired. Home goes in any bean. We are not gods. And so therefore in that messy world, we have some approximation of what social justice is. The care of the planet in which God then is present and we care very much for it. The pilgrimage, the restorative justice in the case of problems, the empathic cartographic imagination in which we imagine a better world. But these moments are few and between in our human existence. Social justice begins with laws of equality but transcends such laws. And that's why we cannot wait for just civil laws to activate social justice. They will never come maybe. Uh, Michel fought for a long time for the rights of transgenders in, in a very traditional, sometimes outdated and unhappy place like Chile. But the homosexuals had them. And they say, well, why is it that they have the, they have the dignity and we don't have it? That's why maybe I have a soft heart for her simply because it's very logical that if every human being has dignity, then why one group will not have it? And she was, she was kicked out of meetings um, and others saying that no, transgenders will not constitute subjects of the law. So let's settle this long introduction. And let's settle on the basics of the Christian journey. We can argue that God walks as one of us in history, seeking justice, not because justice is a virtue or value that comes from the heavenly realm, but only because God walks as her choice with all of us. We are divine representations, unrealized and in constant need of reform, of love, of acceptance, and of revolutionary attitudes worthy of the kingdom of God and his justice. Thus, my reflections today follow such beginnings on the nature of God, the church, and justice within a pandemic representation of pestilence and sickness. We learn during the pestilence of COVID-19, still among us, that it did not depend on our money, on our entitlements, or on what we thought ourselves that somebody was put in a ventilator in hospital. We had a, a hard lesson to learn there. So therefore, the primordial human who suggests that God has an established order, seeks justice for all, capital letters, 
regardless of justice's connection with one's contextual understanding. I'm going to ask a very hard question, probably unpopular. I'm already taking the train. Somebody asked me the other day, will Putin achieve salvation into the kingdom of God? I have to say, why not? God forgives and loves all. And if we come short of saying, no, no, it will not be, then we are falling short of our entitlement of being saved by somebody else could not. It, it, it pains me to say that General Pinochet, the dictator of Chile, it was up to God when he died, if he was going to heaven or hell. I don't have any power over it. But sometimes we cut in our own limited understanding. So the sense of justice arises from humans who seek to change their unfulfilled sense of knowing and who seek justice, but can only provide retribution. It is in this moment of retribution then that the service of the church to the poor and the marginalized, the raped, the beaten up, the rejected, those who are not at the margins of society, but who are nothing in society, come into terms. Those who are rejected by Christians and society are not only the object of our affection and justice, but they are the subjects of history and salvation. So the refugee is not somebody I'm helping with getting on in life, but the, um, the refugee becomes my teacher. He becomes my guide because he's more fragile and he has a sense of how to go about life with no entitlements. So, these people that we talked about, the traffic, those abused, they are not solely manifestations of God. They are God, Emmanuel, present with us today. We cannot deny that theologically. So what is the, apart from, apart from a stiff drink, what is the solution to this? We must return to the extra muros outside the walls. If you are within the walls and you're very famous and you're very learned and you have lots of titles, then you must go outside the walls where the lepers are because it is there where our master and Lord walk the earth. He could have been the founder of a rabbinical school, six store building corporation in Jerusalem and have new courses about the new Judaism, he didn't do that. So with fear and trepidation under the rain and under the sun, our path must cross with those of the poor, the marginalized and excluded. It is there at the peripheries that the Lord walks with us. Social justice is not a theoretical reflection, but the result of action, an action that requires the coming out of my situation of entitlement to know those with no rights, no home, no dignity, no food to put on the table. They are, according to Camila Vergara, the Pelvean Network. They are, according to Michel Clementi, the underprivileged. They are, according to Victoria Turner, the entitled to hunger for justice and grace. Theirs is the new plebeian republic and the kingdom of God here and now. And I, I go here with John Sobrino, the, the Salvatorian theologian, who clearly stated in his latest work, sine pauperis nulla salus, without the poor, there is no salvation. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana, so much for stimulating us and challenging us from so many different angles, uh, and not least this question of uh, entitlement and non-entitlement. Thank you for, for so much there. So any questions in the room or any questions in the distant room? Jonathan. Yeah. Um, can I first of all say thank you very much for completely stimulating uh, your um, Questions about support. 
Um, and he mentioned his Roman citizenship as his title. Um, he doesn't directly mention his citizenship in his letters. It's Luke and Alex who brings it up. Um, do you think it comes through in the letters anyway, indirectly, that it's an Olympus that uh, he is from an entitled background and therefore the letters are legal? Um, I'm not going to like should, I, should I repeat it? Yes, can, can you repeat I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Yeah. So yeah, uh, just a question there about Paul and whether, um, it, not that Paul himself mentions his citizenship in his letters, it's Luke that mentions his citizenship, but uh, the question is to Mario whether um, whether his citizenship is implied in any way in his letters, and that may be an issue. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not a Pauline scholar, and I come from a tradition in which maybe the scriptural reading is not taking us thoroughly as in others. And therefore, my reading is that if we don't problematize our understandings, we will, we will end with an entitlement. So is, is Paul entitled? Yes, because he's like any leader in the church in that he's writing letters that are going to be looked very um, carefully by the communities he writes to. We don't know if his corrections to communities happened or not, but he has an authority, as he says, given to me by Christ under the Damascus experience, which makes it a different person than just one of the victims that came to the first Christian community or a widow and said, I don't have enough to eat. Could I join your community? There is a change in the Pauline corpus of what the Christian community was in a way that it was a group of people who have had an experience of empty tomb, resurrection, and cross who live together and then share everything and you know in so many talks they have said to me surely they didn't share everything well they probably had very little so they probably they just got food and share it in the evening the eucharist comes out of that experience and what we have is then the appearance of paul the apostle which complicates things i'm not saying that maybe god didn't want that i'm not talking about that and I'm saying there is a change in the community in that suddenly uh, Paul discusses with the philosophers. So the, always when academics and intellectuals are in, this becomes very complicated because simply opinions don't have the same uh, weight than somebody else. So by the time that Paul is in a sense gone to heaven and so forth many centuries later. The Christian tradition of the early century is, is converted into something else. I include my dear Pope Francis. He's entitled to his opinion because he's the Pope. He's entitled to something else. So there have been enough discussions on the principle of authority in the church, for example which always creates some kind of problem. So the, the entitlement of the 21st century and the social justice needs to look at the closest periods to the resurrection. And if we look at those, that's why I say I'm, I'm not a feminist. I, I'm a white male. I, you know, I keep apologizing, but simply I'm not, I'm not a great rebel in theology. Um, I studied theology in Germany, and so therefore uh, I'm probably most classical than anybody else. But if you look at the first experience, you see the women leading, for example, the charge to the empty tomb. You see Emmaus. This is a master who sits with somebody else and makes them feel dignified. They have food, and they sign that they're recognized. Thomas comes and says, I don't believe this thing. He's entitled to do so. 
but there is, there is a group which is moving together without the titles of nobility. And suddenly we end up with the possibility that some sectors of our communities, and this I have experienced myself, somebody who plays the organ in a church is a very honest, good and excellent person. But every reverend has a problem sometime because the organist will say, sorry, I'm entitled to my opinion. You don't know any music and we have, we have sung this hymn for Palm Sunday since anybody can remember. In all those attitudes, we're not saying that people are bad, no. But we are saying that sometime we don't take God as seriously as we should. This, this is a complement to the more scriptural traditions. You take very, very seriously what the text says. And those texts are telling us sometimes different things than what we understand as social justice. I thought for a moment you were going to say what I usually get, which is, well, but you know, God does not discriminate among poor and rich. And the poor in, in reality are not that poor and so on. No, we're talking about a, a category which is not economic. We are talking about the excluded. And those are mentioned in the Sermon of the Mount and others, which are at the center of the Christian life and the, and the churches and the communities. And so therefore, um, to me, entitlement, and I, I put it in my lecture and if some of my students are watching, I do apologize, but I noticed the change. I've been 28 years in St. Andrews. Therefore, I am a bourgeois, middle class, etc. Have a nice office. Um, but simply, students 20 years ago were very much a community on the move. And once we have, particularly with the pandemic, we have people who I see as telling me they're entitled to so many hours of supervision. And they're entitled to this, and they're entitled to free education, and they're entitled to uh, their Friday lunch, and entitled. And so this word, and they're brilliant, and they're very good. But this word started going into my writings, entitlement. Isn't that what Christians sometimes feel? I'm entitled because I'm just, and I do whatever it was asked of me, but the person does not look that passage in which you know this young man comes and says you know I come from a good family I've done whatever and the Lord says and now I'm asking you to leave everything notice that the the, the scriptures are are terribly intense they are not what we make of them sometime they're very intense and so entitlement becomes the possibility especially if we have just laws which are entitled to different things become a kind of a sleepy dream for social justice. Because if I'm okay, then I could help the other person. But that is not enough. Because the example we have, the master gave his life for the rest. These are very intense processes. Um, every bit of the scriptures is terribly, terribly intense. I cannot, that's why I, I love the empty tomb because it makes me feel, you know, I was shouting at the BBC commentator over Holy Week because the commentator said, now we are in the waiting. And I said, for the sake, the waiting, we're waiting. We are here fragile. Like any, any person who has been discriminated without dignity because we don't know if our community is going to continue. It's a shattering experience. The experience of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the experience of any mother who has lost a child. And that is a game-changing experience for the rest of the person's life. It is not just, oh, he died. Oh, he died for our sins. Oh, lovely. No, it must have been an extremely shattered. If we had David Thomas and, and Rocio and their investigation can be contested, but it's quite credible that there was sexual abuse in between. Well, we have a horrid moment 
in humanity. And this is the moment that we should capitalize in order to learn, not in order to judge, but in order to learn that systematically, since the Exodus, it seems that God has surrounded herself with the victims and the poor as a category, those who do not have entitlement to anything. And we tend to then, um, you know, of course, the Catholic schools, for example, are a, an example of, yes, good education will bring good Christians, and so we must have the best education. But I always question if the best schools, Ampleforth and so forth, have actually done what they're supposed to do, or if they are just an expression of, I'm entitled to good education because I am paying. In my 28 years, there was only one parent who said to me, I was expecting more of you because we are paying fees, you know, and they're very expensive, right? Entitlement. I pay you and so on. Christianity cannot be that entitlement because otherwise the whole fight and reconciliation of the, of the Reformation will have been a shamble. It was, it was fought. That's why people from our different families kill each other, simply because of the gratuity of grace. And what I'm saying in the entitlement, non-entitlement, is that it feels in the text that at any given moment, God took the side of the victims. And that therefore we should do the same. This doesn't mean that if you have a good house, you should get rid of that house, but it means an attitude of the soul. Social justice is not a public policy for the churches. It is an attitude that comes from divine revelation. And this is extremely serious, much more than a policy that can be changed by the next government. This is not Boris in action is God. And so therefore the moment that you talk about social justice, uh, this is frightening, it's a frightening moment because it means that the order that is there, the divine order needs to be actualized and it's easier to do it in the non-divine order. You can put any amounts of millions and create better schools or do something. But when it comes to the soul, this is, this is a very difficult thing. And that's why I admire this, um, I would call them younger theologians, but they are, they are people who, who weren't there 10 years ago. SCM Press, for example, in case the editor is listening, uh, not only has very colorful uh, front covers, which I like, but it has, it has managed to discover a new generation of prophets. And this is extraordinary. Um, including our chairman, the book to come out here in summer. I, I don't remember seeing one book after another of a deep self-reflection on church warrior. It's a, it's, a, it's a very golden moment that we didn't have for a while. We had the repetition of things. And now we have, we have for example, Victoria, who then suddenly comes up with this edited collection. I mean, when I read it, of course I was uncomfortable, of course. Of course, I said, oh, well, but then deeply in, it's very clear that the young are interested in following God, and sometimes we are a hindrance. They are not a problem. We are the problem. Secularism is not a problem. We are the problem. There have always been full churches, which is, is of no worry to me, but, but simply there have been full churches when you have Prophets who help people. When you have people standing there at the, at the food bank, that is a great moment in that you realize that somebody else needs you. And that moment is social justice because you are going to not only to give food, but you're going to ask what are the causes that they wouldn't have food. And I think particularly British society has grown in the last few years enormously on asking for the causes of this. We are asking about everything from British petroleum to 
um, everything that's in the supermarket, why is it so expensive? It's a very clear question. Why is it that something like that could be so expensive? So I, I think that to me, I was my remit was simply to look at social justice. And it would have been easier to do a little analysis of Manchester and then the church in Manchester and say, I think the policy should go like that. No, I'm afraid the gospel is, is like a sword. Suddenly it hits you and you realize this is intense. This is not just about the public policy. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, not a, it's not a secret that I always felt very enthusiastic, for example, about the young reverence in the Anglican, in the Anglican church with the Roman collars and jumping around and full of life. But that is an issue of dignity and justice. They were ordained after there was a deep reflection. Yes, it took 10 years, but it needed 10 years in order to be a deep reflection, not on public policy, not on fashion. Okay, women are equal and therefore in society they should have the same places. Now, the intense reflection on the dignity of a human being coming from God. And therefore, that's why I returned to Camila Vergara, because that, that book appeared one day in my, on my desk. And I, I thought, why am I reading this? Um, and then suddenly I, I saw the parallel between her own secular criticism of societal structures and the churches, in that the, the people who do not have a voice are not in the imagination. I have a voice. Yes, I have a desk. Yes, I have a salary. Yes, I have a car. Yes, I get invited to give a lecture. Yes, um, whatever. But there are people who don't. And I think God is very clear in the history of the church and the scriptures that simply social justice is not a public policy. It is something that was there from the very nature of God, because otherwise, nothing will have been mentioned about it. And that's why, you know, maybe this, this writing will go into the empty tomb. To me, the empty tomb is, is the moment in which you feel totally fragile. And when you feel fragile, you start understanding um, the best moments of God with us. And therefore, those moments of incredulity about it doesn't make sense. Somebody said to me one day, um, are you telling me, this person said to me, are you telling me that you can sin for 62 years of your life and that I have gone to mass and I pray my rosary and everything else for those 60 years and that God will treat us with the dignity that both of us can enter the kingdom of God? What kind of God is that one? And I said, that's God. Well, I'm leaving. I'm just, I think it's totally unjust. And you can see there the moment that the justice of God becomes human justice, we have problems. This is a complete, you know, for those of you who are more purist um, and less revolutionaries than the writer, um, this is a revolution the empty tomb and the resurrection. In the, in, the, in the sense, you know, the empty tomb, matter has been redefined. People do not rise from the dead. People die is what makes us human. We die. And our thoughts are what is going to happen. And suddenly you have the redefinition of matter, of molecules, of a phenomenon, and suddenly one human being is risen from the dead. So from that moment onwards, our logic cannot be the logic of the public policy. We can influence public policy. Yes, every church should be influenced in public policy and so on. But we forget sometimes that, particularly if we are established, and here I include the Romans with the Anglicans, for example, um, we are very established. We're extremely established. I mean, Romans have the Vatican State. It couldn't be more established. The head of state is the head of the church. But within that, there is still the possibility of understanding 
that this was an enormous revolution. And this is what I like about Victoria Turner, for example, is that the young are telling us that they feel that this revolution is worthwhile, that this person was risen from the dead. And sometimes um, we forget that because simply we take it for granted. That's why the converts are so marvelous in, in communities because converts see everything fresh. You know, I, I was baptized when I was a month old. And so therefore once and again, one needs to return to a freshness. So that's my very long commentary on Paul. You know, I'm not contradicting anti right, but I think the anti right, you know, we, we were colleagues for many years in St. Andrews, we were staying in the same corridor. And so therefore, he, you know, he gave me his copy of the famous uh, book on Paul. And then I looked at it and I said, my God, this is huge. I mean, did you reinvent Paul or something? I mean, and then he said, no, tell me what you think. And my first thoughts were, by the time that somebody has a huge book written by a great intellectual, which will influence lives, this person is just, just a humble fisherman who appeared in this revolution at the beginning. Immediately I thought, I need, I need to return to the early people who were waiting to be killed. That's what awaited them, you know. The, and so therefore, that's why, you know, the returning with the group, for example, to that place, not to the catacombs, not to the Colosseum, but where the, the Christian community met. Because the question was, do you believe in the Christ? It wasn't how good are you at this? These are two different questions. And then suddenly we had virtue as a possibility of entry. Somebody saying to somebody else, you cannot have your child baptized because simply you're not good enough. I don't think that is anywhere. You know. Yes, some preparation is needed. You know, if there are parish priests among you, forgive me. But when somebody says, well, you didn't do two talks of the 24, we have gone into virtue rather than belief. And therefore, we are with the ones who can explain their faith rather than with the humble who were at the center of this Copernican revolution. And that's my disagreement with anti right in, in between a very deep friendship in that simply, he, he uses the expression when things get hot and difficult, which um, is absolutely marvelous. If I say, for example, um, Tom, would you agree that the apostle Paul was, was a little bit too much. And then he looks at me and he says, there are things that I can say and there are other things that I cannot say. That's all. Yes, he's bound by his tradition. And so I go again and I said, but you know, Paul uses a bit of, a bit of his authority uh, in different ways and Maybe we should have had a circumcision. These are honest questions in the, in the beginnings. What about if we were all Jews at the moment? Reform use in terms of the way. And then he said, well, there are things I can say and there are things I cannot say. Right. But that's why the social justice to me is, and, and I thank you for inviting me to reflect on this because simply this is, this is central to the to the existence of the church and God. Because it is the essence to upheld the principles of God. And the principles of God are not very complicated. Um, and therefore, if love God's, if God loves all, well, you know, we are we are people of Greek philosophy and we are forming this kind of epistemology. And so therefore, we have to say then it's untrue that God doesn't love some. That's my main argument, for example, on the inclusion of, um, of homosexuals in the church. How can you exclude somebody if God doesn't? And this is where you go back to the virtue and belief. So is this the church of the virtues or is this the ones who deeply believe that that moment, which was not only metaphysical, but physical, 
of the empty tomb and the resurrection really happened. And if it really happened, then that put the world upside down. And, and that's all I'm going to say, I think, about Paul. So if God knows, we have a question, if God knows no barriers and we have no right to entitlement, how does this critique, how does this critique and challenge clerical power and how it is exercised? Completely. Completely and utter, get rid of them. My, my position, I'm not saying get rid of the clergy, but if somebody exercises, for example, um, you know, somebody who has abused children, I have disagreed myself with Pope Francis on the means and ends of the canonical process. I will get them out first, then ask the questions, because simply you are put in a proceeding where you are defending the abuser, not the victim. And in law, in general, you, you protect the victim first. Another one, um, I've, we've heard about, I've heard about borders that are porous. Are they possible? What would they look like? It depends where you are. And, and this is here, I'm conscious that we are, we are in a sense in the United Kingdom. Um, and therefore, uh, there is more wealth, there, are more, there is more rights, there is a stable government and so on. So the borders are different than in the global south where maybe the border is somebody cannot feed himself or herself or cannot send the children to school. So the context is very important there. When you look at the border, there are no borders, but if, if, if you go to the peripheries as borders, then you need to look where you are. And therefore, that's why I was, I was thinking, you know, a very good, a very good peripheral place are the, are the food, um, are the food places, for example, in Manchester or Birmingham or London. This is the place where the people who do not have the food and the ones who have it encounter each other. These are places of extraordinary good encounter. So I'm not saying everybody needs to, even the master said it, but I don't that everybody needs to sell everything and, and change their lives. But I'm saying we all have the opportunity to see that there is a consistency between the revolution of the resurrection and our lives. These are not two separate things. Thank you. Another one. Uh, without the poor, there is no salvation. This seems to be true. How do we who are non-poor approach this without exploiting the poor for our own ends? By becoming poor. That's what the great saints will say. By becoming poor and therefore to think on a style of life and a way that, um, which I think the British churches in general carry very well, for example. But, um, you know, I, I had a friend, uh, just to give you an example of the bad practice, I had a friend who became a bishop. And then, and then he said to me, um, well, you know, this is such a great moment. I could only get the tailors from the Vatican to do my suits. And I look at him and I said, is that really necessary? He said, of course. There you see the movement away from the poor. And that is not a movement away when somebody because needs clerical dressing or vestments for the liturgy is dressed well. But this goes inside, it's the heart that moves you. Uh, thank you, especially in your statement that God expects more from us than to just be civil servants discussing policy. How would you express our calling when it comes to social justice? Complete, intense, every day, hope, hoping like the first Christians that the kingdom of God could come. Uh, there was a reflection that touched me by somebody in Chile while I was there in, in After Pestilence One. The person said, well, we can only, what we can only do now because there are no vaccines and no medication is to wait for God. And then I said, is that a bit extreme? And then the person said, isn't that what the first Christians did? They were waiting for the second coming. We will come anytime. And now in 21st century, the one way to say, well, the Lord will come tonight, if I will say, I don't think so. No, that will not happen. This is the change, you see, that the first community lived to wait for the Lord. 
And then suddenly we had that opportunity in during the pandemic. It was very hard, very sad. And, um, you know, I lost 27 friends, for example. So COVID, it wasn't a very nice thing, but it reminded me of those reflections of that person that sometimes we act like if social justice is going to come, it means that we believe that the kingdom of God can be realized here and in the future. Here in social justice, in the future then, in that we are waiting for the Messiah. That's who we are. And sometimes we don't. No, because you know, if the Messiah were to come on Monday, then my diary is full, so that will be inconvenient. You see? Maybe the Lord will come on Monday at night. And, you know, I, I said, I said to, to one of my secretaries once, um, I said, I think Tuesday <clears throat> could, could happen that, um, you know, just jokingly, I said, could be I'm not available because the Lord could be coming. I said, I don't think so. You have an opening at 10 o'clock. Shall we fill in with somebody? This is where you look at yourself. And I, I like the, the humor of the audience. Yes, we, you must have humor and we must have humor. But it's simply, we don't realize we have lost that pristine waiting of the first community. I think this may need to be our last one. We'll see how we do. But uh, I, I work with LGBT asylum seekers who are marginalized in church because they are so often seen as a group of people who we feel we can do good to, that we are doing mission for as if inclusion and love are our gifts to give them, not as people who already have dignity, love and grace, because they are given by God and not us. So how can we translate this sense of understanding that the marginalised have voices that we need to hear in our entitled and privileged churches, that we need to be led by their voices? By listening, very, very simple. You know, like Michelle, whom I met a few years ago, he had a tremendous impact on me. And I, I, you know, I say I'm a heterosexual because somebody would say, oh, he has this agenda. And no, you, say, you know, somebody else told me that this tragedy that had happened. And so therefore, uh, listening and then patience, patience on both sides. You know, criticism in the church is possible as well, but it needs to go with that personal commitment to change. You know, I'm, I'm preventing here, I'm going in the train tonight, but simply the fact is that churches will have to decide and they will have to reflect, for example, on civil unions. Nobody else can come and say, oh no, you are out of guilt. No, these are processes. And if you do those processes with the LGBTIQ, um, then you will get something out of it because simply you will see human beings who are trying to say to you, look, I am, I am a child of God and I, I feel this way. It usually is the ignorance of different parties that, that brings to homophobic uh, tendencies and, and others. I, I think, I, I think um, if that is the last question, simply we need to be intensely Christian. And to be intensely Christian is to return once and again to that early experience and reject that other people could say, well, um, we are civil servants, for example. And so by, by passing more laws we could do, no, that helps. But, but simply it's, it's um, um, you know, the, the latest um, problems or the scandals in politics have shown for example, the Arsovish of Canterbury, very, very clear, put in the line. Um, I think we have lost a little bit of that shining resurrection because simply there have been years which have been very difficult. And precisely now, you cannot push people to be as intense as before because we have suffered through the pandemic. We must exercise caution there. We are all wounded, we are, we are a walking hospital. Um, I was thinking, you know, that I haven't given a public lecture in two and a half years. Until last week, I hadn't been on a train. And, you know, I even thought, would I perform again? Would I say something? Huh? Would the mind connect to the page? Um, 
at, the, at this moment, I think there is the moment of inclusion, but there's the moment of patience with everybody. There are people who are a bit more tense. Yeah, I've noticed, for example, in, I noticed in the train and in the supermarket, and suddenly you are, you're just walking and somebody else almost gives you a push. That comes from the tension of the pandemic, from the fear of death, from, we're not very social at the moment. We have been on our own. And so therefore, but that is what we discuss with anti right. It's simply that this is not, a, I'm not going to say change is possible because that is not the resurrection experience. The resurrection experience is that there is a cataclysm that we can then latch onto in another language. And therefore social justice is the pinnacle where the kingdom of God is realized because everybody has dignity, meaning all, meaning everybody. We have gone a long way uh, between disabled, um, visually impaired. We have gone a long way in the last 25 years. It means it can be done. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mario, for sharing with us, giving us such thorough answers to questions and for stimulating us uh, this evening. Forgive me for saying so, but you are entitled to our gratitude uh, for this and for so much. Thank you. Thank you.